Inequality is a defining issue of our time, and many papers have explored the causes and consequences of the widening gap between rich and poor. This work generally distinguishes between income inequality and wealth inequality. Income measures a household's annual cash inflows, for example, wages and salaries, income from self-employment, and dividend payments. Wealth is calculated by summing the value of a household's assets, both financial and non-financial, and then subtracting its debt, while income inequality measures disparities in how much households make, wealth inequality measures disparities in their net worth. How have income and wealth inequality evolved over the last several decades, and to what extent are they linked? Are shifts in one reflected in shifts in the other, or have they moved on divergent paths? This paper uses a newly compiled dataset, dubbed the SCF+, to answer these questions. These data comprise over 100,000 household observations over 35 years, track all sources of household income as well as all assets and liabilities, and thus allow the authors to study the joint evolution of income and wealth inequality in the U.S. from 1949 to 2016. To start, consider the Gini coefficient for income and wealth over this period. The Gini coefficient is a summary measure of inequality, ranging between 0 and 1, with higher values indicating greater inequality. These figures show that regardless of whether we look at income or wealth, the U.S. is more unequal today than it was in the 1970s. Importantly, however, the trajectory shown in each of these figures is quite different. While income inequality rose steadily over this period, starting from a low of 0.43 in 1971 and reaching 0.58 in 2016, the wealth Gini fluctuated around 0.8 for much of this period and changed relatively little between 1950 and 2007. To illustrate these differences more starkly, the authors separate households into three groups based on their location in the wealth distribution. For each group, they plot the trajectory of income and wealth growth over this period. Looking first at income growth, we see the components fueling the rise in income inequality. While the incomes of households in the top 10% of the wealth distribution doubled between 1971 and 2007, income growth was low for those in the bottom 90% and essentially stagnant for those in the bottom 50%. The picture looks very different when we examine wealth growth across these same groups. From 1971 to 2007, wealth growth was largely identical across the distribution. Hence, the pattern seen earlier, that while income inequality rose over this period, wealth inequality was relatively flat. What explains these differences? As total income became increasingly concentrated at the top of the distribution, why wasn't there an accompanying increase in wealth inequality? The answer proposed in this paper, and one of its key insights, is that this is driven by systematic differences in the kinds of assets held by households at different parts of the wealth distribution. Recall that wealth is calculated by summing the value of a household's assets and then subtracting its debt. These figures show what the composition of wealth looks like at different parts of the distribution. The bottom 90% is highly leveraged, meaning that their debt levels are high, and breaking down the asset side, residential real estate is the primary piece. In other words, the largest component of wealth for this group is their house. The top 10% on the other hand looks very different. These households have low levels of debt and hold the bulk of their wealth in stock and business equity. These differences in portfolio composition are highly persistent. The top row here shows the share of total housing owned by each wealth group in 1950, 1971, and 2007, 
while the bottom row shows the same for stocks. Consistently across time, the bottom 90% has always held a sizable portion of all housing wealth, but only a tiny fraction of stocks. Put another way, houses are the asset of the bottom 90%, while stocks are the asset of the wealthy. This has important consequences for how the housing market and stock market affect the distribution of wealth. Changes in house prices strongly affect the middle class and have little impact on the wealthy, while the opposite is true for changes in stock prices. All else equal, periods of rising house prices reduce wealth inequality, while stock market booms increase it. This insight helps explain the patterns we saw before. While the bottom 90% lost substantial ground in terms of income between 1971 and 2007, they largely maintained their wealth share thanks to a strong housing market. In fact, the authors argue it is possible that strong wealth gains for the middle and lower middle classes over this period helped to dispel discontent about stagnant incomes. The 2007 financial crisis, however, led to major changes. The deep and sustained housing market collapse hit the bottom and middle of the distribution with substantial wealth losses, while a relatively quick stock market recovery increased wealth at the top. Together, these produced a historic spike in wealth inequality and may have contributed to the perception that inequality more generally has risen in recent years. In conclusion, this paper argues that systematic differences in households' asset portfolios can help explain the long-run decoupling of income and wealth inequality. Beyond the results shown here, this paper also sheds light on other long-run trends, chief among them the persistence of racial wealth inequality, and with the SCF+, Plus, offers a new resource for studying the dynamics of income and wealth inequality in the U.S. To read more on this topic, you can check out the paper's references to other related work. These include many recent papers documenting and exploring long-run trends in inequality, those studying heterogeneity in the returns to wealth, and finally, theoretical work on the dynamics of wealth inequality.